Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the EpiWin webinar today on the A5.5 subvariants and where the pandemic is going. We'll just give a few minutes for all participants to join before we start. Sorry, Supraya, so I still don't have the booth. I don't have the booth. I still have the button for the the people who attend the meeting. I think it is, from what I've heard before, it is a button which is at the bottom somewhere. I can't hear you, you're muted if you're talking to me. Um, I think we should start now. So welcome everyone. Uh, to I, the do not have, I do not have the booth. Um, Murray. Yes. Yeah. Um, I have no booth. Uh, Murray, so we're just working on it. Can, can, in the meantime, can we just start the webinar? Um, so welcome everyone to the EpiWayne webinar Omicron BA.5. What do we know about the new COVID uh, variants of concern? We have a very distinguished panel today. Um, uh, we, uh, we have Sylvie Briand, the Director for Epidemic and Pandemic Prevention and Preparedness, um, unfortunately had some urgent commitments and could not attend. But we have a short video from her, which we will play shortly. I'd like to welcome you also to the other uh, uh, speakers today. We have Maria Van Kerkhoff, who has been leading the COVID-19 response for WHO. We have Dr. Anurag Agarwal, who is the director of the CSIR Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology in India, and also the chairman of the uh, technical advisory group for uh, virus, uh, uh, the PE. And then we have Dr. Kanta Subarao, director of the WHO Collaborating Center for Reference and Research on Influenza, uh, based in Melbourne, Australia. Dr. Uh, Professor Dale Fisher, who was the former chair of GOAN and senior consultant for infectious diseases in the National University of Singapore. He's also been speaking, all our panelists have been speaking throughout to the public in the, uh, during the pandemic. And I also have with us my colleague, uh, Yubika Latinovic, and I'm Supriya Bezbarwa. I'm the team lead for the WHO Information Network for Epidemics, or EpiWin as it's known. So welcome to all the uh, speakers and to all the participants. Thank you very much for joining. If you have any questions, please put it on the Q&A. And uh, please do uh, introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, 
I'd also like to let you know that we have this live streamed on YouTube and it will be recorded. Before we start, I'd just like to present a short uh, video from uh, Ruby Briand, uh, mm. our, our, our director. I'm just sharing my screen here. Good morning, Dr. of the uh, Thank you very much for being with us today for this uh, webinar on uh, Omicron Therapy. Um, the recent situation with the five, the five, says us that the virus continues to evolve, still around us, and so as the virus evolves and adapts, uh, we need also to adapt our strategy for the response. And that's why this webinar is so important because we can share knowledge. We can share questions as well, and also uh, um, we find together the solution, the best solution, response to this uh, COVID-19 crisis. So thank you very much for joining us again for co-developing the solution with us at the very show, and uh, I wish you a very fruitful uh, And that was Dr. Sylvie Briand, Director for Epidemic and Pandemic Prevention and Preparedness. We now uh, uh, request Maria to give an overview of the pandemic and the new uh, the trends in the new variant. Over to you, Maria. Thank you, Supriya, and, and thanks to everyone who's joined the webinar today, especially to the panelists who are here online. It's really great to share the screen with you, and hopefully we'll be able to do these things in person someday again soon. So I'm going to spend just a couple minutes very briefly setting the context for the discussion in which we are having today. A um, couple of slides. So as you know, uh, this pandemic continues. Um, what you can see on this slide is the epidemic curve which are the cases that are reported to WHO since the beginning of this pandemic. Cumulatively, we've had more than 600 million cases reported to WHO, but we know that the number of infections is far, far higher than this in the billions. Up to today, uh, we've had more than 6.4 million people reported to have died from COVID-19. Again, this is an underestimate of the true toll that it has taken. And there are some estimates putting this at, to be at least three times higher than that. But the virus is still circulating at a very intense level as we are in the third year of this pandemic with more than almost 4.2 million cases reported last year and 13,716 deaths reported in the last week alone. Now, again, those are both underestimates, particularly on the cases, because policies for testing have changed over time. The number of self-tests has increased, which is a very good thing, but that's not really captured in our surveillance systems. Around the world is very, very different. Every country is in a different situation um, in terms of the circulation of the virus. These are epidemic curves based on WHO regions, the six WHO regions um, from around the world. And you can see there are different patterns in terms of the peaks and troughs of activity. The black line in each of these uh, figures indicates deaths that are reported. Now, overall, we are seeing a decline in deaths recently, but that was following quite a sharp increase um, in, in recent months. Um, and this indicates to us that this virus still has quite a ways to go. It is circulating at a very intense level. And with the large number of deaths that we've seen, unfortunately, more than a million people have died this year alone. Um, it's, it's really uh, tragic because there are so many tools that we have in place. The reason we're bringing this webinar to you today is to really talk specifically about one aspect of the pandemic and the fact that SARS-CoV-2, this virus um, with infection causing COVID-19 continues to evolve. These are two images which are tracking the circulation of the variants of concern and the colors indicate the different variants of concern that WHO has classified as variants of concern. On the top, you can see from the beginning of the pandemic, um, the different circulation with alpha in purple, uh, delta in blue, and now we have Omicron 
The figure on the bottom is Omicron and the subvariants that are circulating. You've heard of BA.1, BA.2, BA.4, BA.5, and now BA.5 is dominant um, around the world. Omicron, variant of concern, all of these sublineages, these subvariants are variants of concern. About 85% of the sequences that have been shared with open platforms like GISAID, and the, the figures that I'm showing you comes from data um, sequences that have been shared with GISAID and analyzed by groups like NextStrain and others um, to visualize this circulation and this change over time. So among the sublineages, 85% of the sequences that we have available now are BA.5. BA.4 is declining globally, although we have a sublineage of BA.4 four, which is BA.4.6, which is increasing in sub areas. We see BA.2.75 overall globally at about 2% prevalence, but in some countries it's dominant, such as in India. The point in showing you this is not to give you all of the different names of all of these sublineages, but to say that this virus continues to change. You've heard us say many times, the more this virus circulates, the more opportunities it has to change. And it is really critical for us to continue to track known variants of concern and to detect new ones. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that's important. Last point for me is a figure on the left, which you can see in the upper panel, um, a sharp decline um, in actual, if my, if my cursor will work, if you follow it here, you can actually see a very sharp decline in the numbers of sequences that are being shared, are being sequenced first and foremost, but also being shared on platforms like just say this, puts WHO and our partners um, in compromise because we aren't able to actually analyze this as best we can, given that we have a reduction in the data that is available to actually make those assessments. So we are pleading with our countries, with our member states to ensure that we have strong surveillance for this virus so that we could better understand the circulation of the variants, um, the subvariants, as well as to be on the lookout for new ones because we expect that there to be more variants of concern as this virus continues to evolve. So I will stop there and I will pass back to you, Supriya. Thank you so much, Maria, for that overview. And it's very clear how things have changed over time. Uh, so now, you know, two years have uh, uh, gone by in the pandemic. The question that most people are thinking of is what is the significance of these subvariants in terms of their symptoms, their clinical manifestations? Um, are they different in terms of severity, in terms of transmissibility? Um, and, and what can we do? Uh, how can, what are the tools to protect ourselves? So thanks, Supriya. So um, the significance of this is that, you know, we're, we're in the third year of the pandemic and the virus continues to change. It is expected. This is what viruses do. They naturally change over the time. And, and the more it circulates, the more opportunities it has to change. So this is really important for us to be able to track this natural phenomenon. And we need to be in a better position to determine why this is happening and, and the rate at which these changes are happening. We're also on the lookout for reassortance. So combining of variants, um, combining of viruses that are circulating around the world. We're also on the lookout, this is a zoonotic virus. There are many animals that are susceptible to this virus. So we're also on the lookout for this virus jumping back from humans into animals, potentially changing and mutating within animals. We had a cluster five variant in September, 2020, which circulated in minks. It mutated quite a bit was transmitted back into humans. Luckily, that one didn't take off in humans, but this is a risk. And so for us as scientists around the world and as the World Health Organization, we work with people all over the world to help us better assess. And when I say assess, we look at several things. One, what is the change in transmissibility, if any, in terms of the virus's ability to replicate? Are there changes in the mutation and the profile of the virus itself that make the virus better at replicating? Are we seeing properties of immune escape, which mean that our countermeasures don't work as well as they potentially could? I, I hesitate to say viruses are smart because people will come back to me and say viruses aren't alive. Viruses are not alive, but they're clever in the sense where their job is to replicate and it's to infect people. So they're getting better at finding ways to continue to do so. So we look at uh, transmission in, ter in terms of the intrinsic properties of the virus plus immune escape. We look at severity. What is this virus doing in terms of causing disease and the rate at which the disease may be severe or cause death? 
Now also remember, three years into this pandemic, we have many tools that are preventing severe disease and death. So population level immunity from vaccination and past infection has increased. So the disease profile of COVID is different because people are better protected. So that's the backdrop. We're also looking at this virus in experimental studies, but also in real world studies to say, is it causing more severe disease or not? And we do this for all the subvariants as well. And then we look at our countermeasures. Are the diagnostics working? Are the therapeutics working? Are the vaccines working? So this is a constant assessment that we are working on. And Dale participates in many of the technical groups that we, we work on. So does Kanta and Anurag. Anurag is leading our, is the chair of our TAG VE, Technical Advisory Group for Virus Evolution. This is the group that WHO uses to make these assessments and have a robust assessment. Kanta is the chair of our TAG COVAC, our technical advisory group to look at the composition of COVID vaccines. All of this information remains critical for us as an organization to take decisions and make give advice on what to do. What to do? We know that we need to not only reduce morbidity and mortality with early clinical care and, and increasing vaccination coverage, particularly for those who are most at risk. Our vaccines work against preventing severe disease. If anyone hears anything on this message today, on this webinar today, please take that home. Really important to get your full doses that are recommended for you we also have to reduce transmission. So while we go back to our lives, while we live our lives, take measures to keep yourself and your loved ones safe. First and foremost, get vaccinated. You can use self-testing if you're going to be doing different things where you're gathering, wear a mask. If you're around others, spend more time outdoors than indoors. We're asking governments to make investments in ventilation. Um, it's this whole comprehensive package. Um, last point for me, and I will, I will stop, is that WHO recognizes the challenges that many countries are facing, that all of you are facing three years into this pandemic. We realize that COVID is one of many things that you are dealing with, but the good news here is that there's tools. So I'm very, very hopeful that we can end this emergency everywhere if we use these tools appropriately. And tools is everything from good information. And so thank you for having this seminar, sharing good information, wearing of a mask, distancing, improving ventilation, getting vaccinated, using tests, using therapeutics. So lots that we can do, lots you can do, and lots governments can do. Thanks. Maria, that's uh, uh, quite a comprehensive response. I'd like to ask any of the other panelists if they have anything to add to what Maria said, uh, your views on, you know, uh, about the different sub-variants and, and how they're different and, and what can, why does it matter really? And what can we, what tools do we have? If anyone would like anything, yes, Dale. Please go ahead, Dale. Um, yeah, um, Maria just gave a nice list, list of the tools, but the one she didn't mention was treatments. And, and there's, uh, not, not that she doesn't know about them, but, but uh, you know, pe people that are at risk of severe disease and they get COVID, then it's, it's absolutely, worthwhile presenting when you're still got mild disease because treatments uh, are, are very effective across the variants at, uh, at, at preventing uh, progression to severe disease and hospitalization. So uh, I just th add that one to the list for completeness. Thanks. Zapriya, you're muted. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Maria. So thank you, Dale, for adding that a uh, bit on treatment as well. Uh, anyone else would like to add anything on No, not right uh, now. Right, thank you. Um, then over to my colleague, Yubika. Uh, thank you, Supriya. Uh, and thank you, Maria, uh, for giving the overview and answering our first questions. And uh, over to Anurag now, we would really like uh, to ask you, why are these COVID-19 subvariants prompting higher infection rates? And why are people getting reinfected? And why some countries are hit harder by the Omicron variants, like for example, UK compared to other countries, uh, especially for example, South Africa? That was one of the questions that we got uh, from our participants. Thank you. Over to you, Andrew. Thank you very much, Lubika. I mean, these questions have been on all of our minds. We didn't expect to be three years into the pandemic and still talking about infections going all around and still resorting to somewhat modifying our lives. 
And the reason for that is what Maria said. We have lots of options, but the virus is also clever in a sense of the word. And when we give it opportunities to transmit, to infect, to replicate, it mutates. Now, the only reason a circulating virus dies down is when people have immunity such that infections go down. Now, this immunity is dependent on what the body has seen and if the virus changes so that the body no longer recognizes it or neutralizes it properly at the time of entry, infection can occur again. So what you see again and again, and you know, after the Delta wave, there was a long period when infections were going down all over the world. And then suddenly Omicron came very, very highly mutated. So the area where antibodies would bind the spike protein was so changed, it was very obvious that in the you know, ability to neutralize the virus from previous immunity would go down drastically and infections would rise. And then soon after BA.1, which was the first Omicron variant, we got BA.2. Again, it was sufficiently different from BA.1 that for those people who had not seen it before, there was a risk of reinfection. Then after BA.2, we got even further mutations. For example, BA.4 and 5 are particularly different. For example, at position 486 and 493 on the spike protein, you get mutations. What you hope in life is that when the virus mutates to evade the immunity, it becomes bad. It becomes unable to replicate properly. It loses some other property of binding to the receptors. And indeed, in BA.45, the 486 mutation would have changed some ability to bind to the receptor. But then counter mutations come, which restore that. And so that's what we are seeing. At this point, in most countries, most infections are either vaccination breakthroughs or they are reinfections. Uh, the truly vulnerable population that has never been vaccinated, has never been infected and is still surviving is becoming smaller and smaller. And this is the answer to the second part of your question, which is why are different countries different? Because some countries have lower levels of vaccination, some countries have higher levels, but by now, almost everybody has gone through multiple waves of infection. And we know that each differences exist between countries. So for example, if you look at South Africa and India, the zero positivity levels from infection, say in the beginning of this year, were around 80 to 90%. The corresponding number in America and UK were closer to 50, 60%. So clearly you have many more people who have recovered from prior infections. The next time the infection occurs, it may not be as severe. Testing, of course, is also different. That's another thing you have to keep in mind. Different countries have different levels of testing, but deaths have been consistently declining across waves, but some countries have a higher vulnerable population that is elderly, particularly those countries that have an elderly, unvaccinated, previously uninfected group would uh, suffer the most. And these inter-country differences are mattering. One last thing I would add to this is the history of recent infection matters. So if you look at BA.4.5 or BA.5, they are descendants of BA.2. So countries that had big waves of BA.2, like India, for example, did not get as big a wave with BA.4 and 5. While South Africa with a BA.1 wave, which is more different, had big waves of BA.4 and 5. So we are at this very interesting point in the world where to really predict the risk of the next variant. We not only have to know details about the current levels of immunization, the levels of infection, but also the background history of what strains have been circulating where. And I would use this point to reinforce what Maria said. Look at the numbers of sequences declining. If the sequences keep declining like this, we will not be able to either monitor new strains effectively or even build the type of history that allows us to predict at a nation level or a regional level what is likely to be more threatening. So we do need to correct that. I hope I was able to answer some of your questions. Thank you very much, Anurag. Thank you uh, for this comprehensive answer. Uh, I would like to ask uh, our other panelists if you would like to add something or comment. I think if I just may on one part of that question around the why countries have had different experiences, um, I fully agree with Anurag and, and, and countries have indeed had different experiences and not just the virus that's been circulating in the different sublineages of Omicron, for example, and even previous variants of concern, but every country has had a different approach to dealing with COVID-19. 
So it, the reason that we're seeing different situations in different countries is a combination of factors. It's the current and previous epidemiology. You know, what are the strains that are circulating and have circulated? What is the current and previous strategies that countries have taken? Many countries have opted for really suppression to prevent the virus entering in. And you've seen a lot of island states do a very good job of preventing the virus from entering their countries and really keeping that down, but not others have, have followed different strategies. Population demographics, risk factors, you know, what is the underlying demographics, the age profile, the proportion of people with underlying condition? What is population level immunity look like over time from infection, from vaccination, from the, the type of vaccine used, the numbers of vaccine used? How does that vary by age? Access to tools. So diagnostics, therapeutics, vaccines, um, PPE, personal protective equipment, capacities to implement all of these tools and to adjust them over time. What is the agility of that? Um, and lastly, trust, public trust. You know, the, with the huge amounts of misinformation, disinformation that's out there and messaging changing over time, given that we learn about this virus over many years, it's very confusing out there and public trust that is an all time low. So all of those factors and probably many more um, really dictate why countries are in different situations. We give these long winded answers because it's complicated, you know, because there are so many different reasons. So we're not trying to be long in our answers here, but it's complicated. And if we had sorted this out, we would be in a very different situation. Again, we have tools. We just need to make sure they're used appropriately and that all countries have access. Not all countries still have access to the vaccine and have used the vaccine, you know, targeting those who are most at risk. So there's still a lot of work to do. Um, and given the virus is still circulating and changing, um, you know, we're committed to, to supporting all member states and achieving those goals of ending that emergency everywhere. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Um, uh, now over to you, Supriya, for her next question for our next panelist. Thanks, Yubika and Anurag and Agarwal. Um, and Maria, sorry. Um, so now there's another question, you know, uh, which has been uh, worrying uh, some of our participants and they've written into us, especially since it was in the news. Uh, it, it's what's called rebound infection. What does that mean really? I mean, does that mean uh, someone has a virus uh, again, uh, or does it mean, is it some prolonged immunological response? Can a medicine provoke that? So if we don't even just have COVID, we have rebound, but you know, what does it mean? So Dale, we'd love to hear your views on this. Thank, thanks, Supriya. They, they will be my views. I'd be interested to hear what the, the WHO view on this, but uh, but by and large, this is really about um, observation of, of uh, symptoms that either had resolved or were improving, uh, they go bad again. Um, and people report uh, deteriorating symptoms. That's the sort of clinical rebound, if you like. Then there's the virologic rebound, where a test that had gone from uh, positive to negative uh, on a repeat test might become positive even just sort of days or weeks later and uh, uh, sort of suggesting that, that viral shedding is, is increasing. Now, this, um, it, 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 at one stage, it was called a Paxlovid rebound. So that's the, uh, the, the antivirals that you can give uh, early in the course. Um, and I should have pointed out earlier that uh, I, I should have um, sort of, uh, I guess, uh, made a contingency that I, I do appreciate that the the world does not have um, equal access to these sort of things. So um, you, you do have to uh, have the availability, I guess. But anyway, what, what's happening in, in what was observed with Paxlovid was that you would uh, have, have mild symptoms, you'd take the drug, typically a, a five-day course. Paxlovid is, of course, a combination of antiviral drugs, um, nemaltrevir and, and ritonavir. Um, and th these will suppress symptoms. Uh, these will decrease the risk of hospitalization uh, and death um, if given early, particularly to at-risk people, uh, so the elderly and the, the immune compromised. But then they found that often when they stopped the drug, uh, the symptoms could come back and you could get this, this rebound. 
but actually there's there's a preprint uh, out now which which suggests that the 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 risk is um, is the same with other antivirals, but it's also probably the same with with no uh, antivirals. So so you can see it in um, uh, just in sort of natural disease, uh, we, which makes me wonder if the whole thing is just part of COVID's um, over scrutiny, if you like, uh, because we are looking at it so closely. Um, we, we we don't do this with flu and cold and go around doing surveys, but but I'm sure many of the listeners would say, yeah, I can remember many times I've had a, a, a viral illness and just when I thought I was getting better, then I then I had a couple of really bad days. So, you know, I, I think recovery is is not a, a linear thing in, in most diseases. And, and certainly there's good dis descriptions of, of dengue that people are recovering and they might start to get back to normal life and then they're then they're really uh, laid up again. Um, so so I think there is some of that when, when you see the viral rebound, which uh, with virologic rebound, which you might say is is a bit more objective. Actually, those CT values are, are really quite high. They're up in the, the 30s from the studies that I've seen. So it, it, it's not like you're suddenly going from a negative test down to a CT value of 15, um, at, at least not typically from the descriptions I've read. Um, and the symptoms tend to be milder. It's not like you're, you're, you're improving and then, then, then suddenly you're heading off to intensive care. It's not, uh, it's not that sort of extreme, but uh, it, it's nonetheless... Um, uh, an observation it can occur um well I've, I've seen a median of about 12 days but but up to 30 days after you, you've started to recover um and and the bottom line is as i was saying earlier these these drugs do reduce uh hospitalizations and deaths and uh and and rebounds um have got about a less than one percent hospitalization rate so so it's really um uh, not so common um so, so I guess that's um, really what I what I wanted to say. The the sort of symptoms that people describe, um, you know, it's it's quite common. Uh, symptoms can can uh, flare uh, in about twenty seven percent of people, even without antivirals. So that was uh, uh, one study, and and the viral the viral rebound was was evident in in twelve percent of cases. So, so it's not uncommon, but it it might just reflect how closely we're we're watching everything that's uh, that's covid um th there's a few theories uh you mentioned reinfection but uh I'm, I'm pretty sure the sequencing that i've seen is not consistent with a reinfection whenever they've done it it's uh it's the same uh is it a mutation that's that's making you um uh so making it escape natural escape the immunity and again that's that's not what's coming out of uh, of the sequencing um the uh you know so it's probably that um you know um in the drug case then there's viral suppression but then you remove the, the drug before the body's immune system has kicked in to actually do the job so the symptoms could flare but then, the, then there's just the other point that recovery is not linear, and you'll have good and bad days, uh, and and fluctuation about the around the negative end of of the testing, um, in in that recovery period. So, so so that's my take. That's not uh, necessarily what what WHO think. I'd I'd like to hear what uh, what Maria's view was. Thanks, Dale. Uh, important. Some, I think some of the important take-home messages is that it, you know rebound has less than a one percent hospitalization rate. It's usually milder, uh, and it's not reinfection. But over to Maria for the WHO. Well, I don't know if I can give the whole WHO overview. I mean, our view is the way that WHO comes to a view is to be able to consolidate data that comes from studies from all over the world. So my own opinion doesn't matter, but what it what we do is we work with experts around the world. For the record, my own opinion on anything doesn't matter, but what we do is we just try to consolidate the data that comes in from studies. So just to, to piggyback on one of the things Dale said, he mentioned a preprint that they looked at, he mentioned some data that he's seen. For us, what we try to do is make sure that we capture that data and we discuss it among our expert networks to, to assess it. So, you know, 
I mean, I agree with what you're saying, uh, Dale, in terms of our understanding of this, looking at the clinical rebound versus the virologic rebound. I think we've heard a lot about this rebound after taking Paxlovid. That's, it seems to get the news and some very high profile uh, people have had that. For, for us, I think it's very difficult to understand the extent to which this is happening um, you know, globally um, and among people who have had access and use of antivirals. The bottom line for us is the is the what does this mean factor. So we have a global goal of making sure people get into the clinical care pathway very quickly, reduce morbidity and mortality. So it's important that they're tracked. But we also want to reduce onward transmission. So what does it mean to have a positive test again? Are you infectious? Are you infecting others? Or do you just happen to have another positive test? The antigen-based test, the self-test that people have been using have been a really fantastic addition in this pandemic really game changer in terms of putting the test results into people's hands. But of course that needs to be linked to action, linked to clinical care, but also what do I, what does it mean for me in terms of protecting the loved ones around me? Um, so I don't have a good global overview of what the amount of rebound is actually happening. Um, but as Dale said, the important factor is what it means in terms of severity and needing clinical care, needing, needing hospitalization, and that is quite low. But this also highlights how much we don't know about this virus. Um, you know, none of us have all of the answers. Um, and this is why as WHO, we rely on experts around the world to carry out the studies, make sure that those studies are really robust and that that data is published, that data is shared so that we can analyze it. So it's, a, it's an incomplete answer because we don't have all of the answers on that yet. Thanks, Maria. Uh, very good point there. You, you know, it's, it's none of us have all the answers and, and everything we know comes from, you know, people looking at data from all over the world. Uh, uh, would uh, Anurag or Kanta like to add to that? I can add this. I mean, let me just reinforce a point that Dale made. If you look at the natural history of any disease, any whether improving spontaneously or on treatment, there will always be a fraction who get better and then get worse. And I think that uh, what Dale subscribed to as one of the possible interpretations that when you suppress the viral replication and while the immunity is still catching up and the drug washes off, there will be a phase where the virus can come back. The most critical point remains that Paxlovid, when given to people at risk of severe disease, reduces the severity, prevents hospitalizations, and even amongst the rebound, the hospitalization rate is very, very low. So I think in the right scenario, we must continue to use it and not be afraid of the rebound per se and changing our perceptions about it. Very good point, Anurag. Uh, if there are no other views, then over to Hubika. Yes, uh, for Kanta, we have a question around uh, the new vaccines and uh, this retooled uh, uh, B-violent uh, COVID-19 vaccines and their effectiveness uh, of the current uh, variants that we have, especially the Omicron variants. And uh, what is actually the performance of, or do we have the data or we are still, because this is quite new, and maybe we can't talk really about the effectiveness completely, but uh, what what is your view? What do you think how these uh, new retooled vaccines will be uh, accepted and work against uh, the new variants? Thank you, over to Kant. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, so the question is about the vaccines and how how what we're doing about the emergence of new variants. And so the WHO had formed a committee to look at um, the data and to advise them on whether and when the vaccine strains might need to be updated. Now, there are many, many vaccines that we use that do not need to be updated. Um, what they were designed to do continues to work well. They're great examples of measles vaccine where we're using the same strain you know, 50 years later. Um, but then there is an example of influenza where we do update the vaccine every year. So that is in fact the, the example that where we update the vaccines most regularly. 
So I think our hope when the COVID-19 pandemic began was that um, we wouldn't have to update the vaccine. And that hope was based on the fact that, um, you know, we didn't ex anticipate this much genetic change and antigenic change in the virus. Um, however, as we've watched over the last three years, the virus has continued to evolve. And a lot of the changes are in the spike protein. The spike protein is the main target of the protective immune response in people. Um, and the spike protein is the part of the, pro part of the virus that attaches to its receptor. So it attaches to the receptor and that's how it gets into cells, but it's also the target of the protective immune response. So the spike protein plays many different roles for the virus. So once you have changes in the spike protein of the virus, um, it can evade the protective antibody response that was generated by prior infection or by vaccination, because virtually all of our vaccines um, contain either only the spike protein or the genes encode, gene encoding the spike protein. And a few vaccines contain, the inactivated vaccines contain additional proteins. But for the most part, our vaccines target the spike protein. So therefore, you know, if you have changes in the spike protein, they could potentially evade the immune response directed at the spike. And as Anurag and others have said, viruses evolve either to improve their binding to the receptor or they evolve to escape immunity. These are usually the way viruses evolve. So we have talked about what changes these changes in the virus mean for the vaccine. And what we've observed is that the currently licensed vaccines that were based on the original ancestral strain have performed, continue to perform very well in protecting against severe illness and death. So they continue to perform very well in that regard, irrespective of what variant we are see, we've seen, including the Omicron variants. However, early on, we did see more protection against symptomatic infection, um, even with the alpha variants. And there was some protection even against transmission within households. So we're, that, there has been a gradual reduction in the amount of, in, in how effective the vaccines are in preventing infection, preventing symptomatic infection or all infection. So while they continue to perform well against severe illness and death, we do see there's a reduction in protection from infection. And that's why we have now looked at the data that's available either in people who've recovered from Omicron infection or with, in people who've received experimental vaccines that incorporate one of the variants. They're vac experimental um, vaccines that have been tested in small populations um, that contain a beta variant or contain both the original virus and the beta variant or the Omicron BA1 variant. And so now we've looked at all of those data and the data suggest that we should continue to um, provide primary vaccination with the original strains because they perform so well in protecting against severe illness and death. But we've also recommended that if you want to broaden immunity so that you continue to get the benefits from the ancestral vaccines, but you want to broaden protection, you could do so by using an Omicron containing vaccine. Um, and that Omicron containing vaccine in some instances, like in the UK, they've approved a BA1 containing vaccine. And in the United States, they've, they've approved a vaccine, a bivalent vaccine that has the ancestral strain and a BA4, BA5 variant. In both cases, we would anticipate that we will, the, the end result will be broadening of immunity when people receive this updated vaccine, having already been vaccinated against the original strain or with hybrid immunity where they've been vaccinated and been infected. So we anticipate that the, both any of the bivalent vaccines containing Omicron variants will broaden immunity. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Kanta, for this um, answer. Anyone from the panelists that would like to add something? 
if not, we are receiving quite a lot of questions uh, from uh, the participants. So we will try to <laughs> read one by one or at least uh, ask. Uh, so, yes. So maybe uh, over to Supriya, if you would like to start <laughs> with the questions that we received. Thanks. 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 Before we go to the questions, actually, um, uh, just to, oh, I'd like to thank Kanta for that very comprehensive, uh, you know, description of how the vaccines work for COVID nineteen. Uh, also, you know, but now people are coming to a stage where they're just wondering, you know, how long is this going to go on? Uh, where are we going with this pandemic? And and we have. Yeah, you know, in the northern hemisphere, we have winter coming up. So, what can we expect? And a lot of countries as well, you know, you, 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 wearing a mask or any of the public health measures are no longer obligatory. So, uh, where are we heading now? Uh, this is open to uh, all of you. So, <laughs> any views? The big question is, who wants to go first? Anurag, definitely. Over. You, you yeah. go first. Yeah. So, you know, I'm going to tie this in to one of the questions that I saw on the QA of are we in an endemic stage right now? I would like to reiterate what Maria said in the very beginning. We are still in the stage of a circulating pandemic. What endemic means to me, and I guess I would love to know what other panelists think, would be when something is restricted geographically, temporally occurring in only a few places. We are still looking at a variant which are circulating all over the globe. What looks like reduced number of infections is often a bias of reduced amount of testing. And indeed in cohorts that we have been following and testing regularly, you see that infections are still high. As long as infections are high and the virus has a chance to evolve, there is never any guarantee that the virus will keep getting milder and keep becoming weaker and you know something just like the common cold. So if I were to project the future, I would say there is a high probability future in which population immunity towards severe disease keeps getting better and better, either because of prior infections or because of better vaccines or both, preferably both, and preferably vaccines actually. And therefore the amounts of deaths due to SARS-CoV-2 infections become progressively limited to a higher risk population. However, there is a low probability event that we can only intervene by reducing the circulation of the virus, of preventing more dangerous variants from arising. It is always a possibility when you're dealing with an evolving virus. And I would simply say that, you know, that part, that small probability, that small possibility rather, is in our hands. And NPIs, again, all the things Maria talked about, better use of ventilation, choices in our lives, will go a long way apart from vaccines and drugs in preventing things. So I'll stop here. So I see a not uh, a very dangerous time ahead, but not one that we can afford to be complacent, uh, especially for the high-risk populations. I'll stop here. I'll add, I think that's excellent um, in, in my view. And, and in fact, you know, WHO, as we think about COVID-19 and how we are going to deal um, with this at a global level, this is a global problem requiring global solutions. We think in scenarios, you know, we think of what may happen and how do we have systems in place to be able to address any of these potential unknowns. The big uncertainty is this virus and it is how this virus is changing. Um, we know it will continue to change, um, become more transmissible because it has to outcompete whatever is circulating potential with more immune escape, but we don't know if the next variants will be more or less severe. On the other hand, we have these amazing tools of diagnostics and therapeutics and early, early antivirals for when people very early in the disease course to prevent them from developing severe disease. We also have good therapeutics for when people are severe to experiencing severe disease to prevent them from dying. And we have vaccines that um, do an incredible job of preventing severe disease and death and do a decent job of preventing infection, although that's not their main purpose. So there's a lot of uncertainty in, in how this will unfold because of the way we're using these, these tools going forward. And the big wild card is the virus itself. So we plan for 
future variants of concern that may be more or less severe. We need to have a strong workforce and health system to be able to deal with COVID plus influenza, plus RSV, plus monkeypox, plus whatever is circulating you know, around. You know, We've changed the disease ecosystem of this planet over the last couple of years because so many people have been home and we've changed our behavior. So we have to be prepared to deal with what's coming forward. But in terms of the virus becoming endemic, this was a very hot topic, I think almost a year ago now, when will it go from pandemic to endemic? And there isn't a switch like that. The virus is here with us to stay. Um, that's for certain. How we manage this virus, how we manage this disease is up to us. And we keep saying that because we have these tools at hand. Given all the global challenges around the world, COVID-19 has solutions. We just have to be able to use them. So it's with us. We have to live with it. I really dislike this phrase, living with COVID, but it's living with it responsibly. 15,000 people dying a week is not living with this virus responsibly when we can largely prevent them while getting our societies back on track. It's not about lockdown. It's not about shutting down societies anymore. So we as individuals can take measures to keep us and our loved ones safe. Governments, we're working with that to set the right policies. In fact, we're going to be issuing a series of policy briefs next week, which really help governments to set the right policies for COVID in the context of three years of a pandemic, exhaustion and fatigue, all of these other global crises that we're dealing with, saying what are the key things that need to be done for COVID to end the emergency, but build a stronger foundation for pandemic preparedness going forward. Um, so it's with us to stay. We just have to manage it appropriately, responsibly, live our lives as safely as we can. Thanks very much, Maria. In fact, one of the questions was also about the role of integrated respiratory testing strategies in identifying new outbreaks, and that sort of addresses that question as well. Um, Dale and Kanta, do you have any further views? And I, I don't think you're going to find us really disagreeing. I'd, I'd strongly support the fact that there is no one day where we're going to say, oh, the pandemic just ended. Uh, th this is a, an evolution. Uh, obviously, we're, we're responding completely differently now than we did in 2020, where it was all about, you know, minimised transmission, you know, is, is the, the only way sort of thing. But now, you know, um, in... Now I'm not allowed to say living with the virus, but uh, it, it is it is settling in to, to a, another disease that people can present to hospital with. And we've just got to work out um, how we can prevent spread in hospital settings where the vulnerable patients are, uh, which is a big sort of IPC talk at the moment. Um, and we've got to get those tools better. We've got to get better vaccines, better treatments, cheaper treatments, better distributed uh, treatments and vaccines and tests and uh, and and I think you know uh, I you know so the pandemic's not over but it but it's it's moving that direction and endemicity you know is that point where where you know there, there's fluctuations but there's a fairly predictable number of cases a fairly predictable um, sort of hospital um, uh, utilization um but also what worries me is uh, as the others have said you know we've got to be ready for something bad to happen you know like like some sort of major new variant of concern that does escape uh, our immunity and i don't think we're doing enough at the moment uh country by country to to build those lessons to to build that community approach. Um, uh, and I would just ask anyone from whatever country they're in, how would it be if government said, you know, tomorrow there's there's a new variant of concern, we have to mask, we have to mask up again, and we have to uh, minimize our our the size of our gatherings. You know, I think some countries would would work well um, because there there's been that buy-in throughout the pandemic. But other countries, I think there'd be a revolution, and and now's the time to to build that sort of uh, you know whole of whole of society approach to responding to a pandemic. Because if your hospitals are getting overwhelmed, um, the society needs to protect them, and it might have to go back to the more blunt measures. Um, I hope it doesn't happen, and there's certainly no no guarantee it'll happen. But but we have to be be better prepared for that, and I and I, I don't see the world moving that way actually. 
Thank you. Thanks. So if, I'm, if I may just add, um, you know, if I look back on, on our experience with influenza, we've had influenza pandemics in 2009. Um, so when do, we, when do we stop calling it a pandemic and when do we stop, start calling it um, seasonal influenza? Um, it happens when the virus actually has gone through in a very large peak and then settles into a pattern that resembles the normal seasonality. So we don't know what that, what that seasonality will be for SARS-CoV-2. We know we have other human coronaviruses that have some seasonal patterns. Um, and so we can, we, I think we are operating under the assumption that at some point, SARS-CoV-2 will begin to follow a seasonal respiratory virus pattern. We're not, see, we, until, the numbers, as you've heard, the numbers of case of hospitalizations and deaths decrease to the point where, you know, seasonal coronaviruses do not take people to hospital or um, cause deaths. So we are, we're a long ways between where we are with the pandemic today and where we might be with the well-established seasonality of this coronavirus um, it, when it gets there. But it may actually in the process of settling into that, it may resemble seasonal influenza with peaks at certain times of year and more severe disease in certain populations, but not in everybody. So I think those are the sorts of patterns we need to be watching for. And as Dale said, I think we really need to make sure we have global surveillance to know what is happening in all parts of the world um, in order to recognize what, what the evolution of the epidemiology has been. So with that, I'll just stop and hand it back to Sabria. Thanks, Kanta. And thanks to all the speakers, actually, uh, uh, you know, looking ahead uh, where we're going and, and very uh, important points about endemicity. Before, we have now, you know, two minutes to go before the end of the hour. But before we end, one last question, uh, maybe I'll throw it to Maria from the participants is, we've talked about COVID and variants. The question is even uh, after COVID, you know, if we have, uh, we have to live with long COVID and, and there's a question about uh, what we can do about that. Uh, so Maria, uh, over to you. What is there any treatment or recommended supplements? What do we do for long COVID? So thanks, Sapria. This this requires much more than two minutes of a response. Yeah. Um, Post COVID nineteen condition or also called long COVID is something we in the world are very concerned about. Um, we have an entire dedicated several teams that are looking at this really to better understand what it is. We know that COVID is often called a respiratory disease, but it actually affects many organs in the body, including the heart, the lungs, the brain, um, and others. And we're, we're beginning to learn about beyond the acute infection when people feel unwell for a period of days or even weeks, sometimes people are feeling better. And then after a few months start to feel very unwell again. People who are otherwise healthy um, are no longer able to exercise. We're seeing some studies coming out looking at cardiac disease, and, and these are quite concerning results. So we've been working um, with clinicians with from many different technical disciplines, with patient groups and others, to better understand long COVID, what it is, how we could define it. We have a case definition now, which we are now adapting for children, um, so that we have better recognition um, better research. And so there are data collection forms that we have. So we have systematic data collection to be able to describe what long COVID is, how we can, how we can better design therapeutics, how we can better design clinical care for patients who are dealing or suffering from post-COVID condition or long COVID, and also better um, rehab. So research recognition rehab is something that we're paying a lot of attention to. So this is a huge portfolio of work. We're asking governments to any scenario we think of when we think of SARS-CoV-2, when we think about this virus, how it will change more or less severe future waves of infection, we have to plan for long COVID. That is part of all future planning for this. And we need systems in place in terms of health systems into primary care to make sure that people receive the care they need. So it would be great. You probably have had many already, but 
another updated webinar, uh, EpiWin seminar on post-COVID-19 condition, I think would be great. Yeah. And I think because, because there's such a keen interest in this, and my answer is not going to do justice to the, to the amount of work that's out there uh, at the moment, but there's still a lot of unknowns. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, there are lots of questions coming in and in fact, uh, complaints <laughs> that we're not addressing them all. But unfortunately, we have the limitations of time. Uh, would uh, So would any of you be able to stay on for a few more minutes to answer some questions? Uh, I know everyone's quite busy. If not, what we will do is share the questions with all our experts uh, and give responses over time and also, uh, you know, put some of these uh, questions and answers on our website, Q&A website, and, and hopefully that will address uh, some of the concerns. We also already have some of the answers in the Q&A in the WHO website, so please do visit that as well. Um, but thank you so much for participating and uh, thanks to uh, all the participants for some very interesting questions which you've shared even before the webinar and during the webinar. Thanks to all our speakers um, uh, for extremely interesting insights uh, I, and very, very relevant ones as we move on to uh, yeah, this pandemic rolls on. Well, and let's see where it goes. Um, and we will have more updates on different topics and, and more discussions on this because uh, as, as Maria and everyone has often repeated, it is not over yet. And, and we all have to work together uh, you know, to be responsible, as Maria said, in, in how we take this forward. It's up to us. Thank you very much. Uh, and um, thanks to you, Pika, as well. Thank you. I'm sorry, my, my laptop crashed. So that's why I disappeared. But thank you very much. Thank you all for your excellent questions, participations, and we will really try to answer all of them one way or another. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.